Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MICD uh, seminar series. I just have a quick announcement uh, for our students. Uh, we have a new form to register your attendance to the seminar, so we'll put the link in the chat, so please use it if, to record that you were here. Thank you, and I'm gonna let uh, Professor Garikipati introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Mariana, and uh, welcome everybody to our uh, MICD seminar. Uh, we're glad to get things uh, going. Uh, we have uh, today uh, Marta Adelia uh, from Sandia Labs um, speaking. Uh, Marta obtained her, uh, started out her career, her, her academic career at, at Politecnico di Milano, uh, working with Alfio Quartaroni, and then came to the US, got a PhD in, um, at, 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 um, at, at Emory University and did a postdoc at Florida State University before joining the staff at Sandia. Uh, she works in, uh, she's part of the data science and computing group at uh, Sandia, California. And Marta is very well known for her work in uh, simulation, uh, optimization, optimal control, and, and really with, with uh, all the great interest nowadays in scientific machine learning, really is one of, one of the leaders of, of the further development of these methods. Um, she is um, also a uh, prominent in the field in other ways. She's an associate editor of the Siam Journal for Scientific Computing, uh, Advances in Continuous and Discrete Models, Numerical Method for PDEs, and also the Journal for uh, Very Dynamics and Non-Local Models. Uh, Non-Local Models are, is, uh, are clearly a, uh, a passion for her. She's co-founder of the One, One Non-Local World Project, uh, um, and her interests, like I, I mentioned before, are, are, are widespread through uh, computational science and especially data science and scientific machine learning. Uh, so without much more ado, I will hand it over to Marta. Uh, welcome and we're looking forward to your talk. All right, thank you. Um, I guess you can see my screen now and you can hear me fine. It, you can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, yeah. Great. <laughs> oh, oh, just one thing. Uh, if sorry, uh, uh, if if you have questions, you can uh, put them in the chat. Uh, or if you think you're being ignored, you're not being ignored. So just unmute yourself and ask the question. But but I'll try to regulate it. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, thanks a lot for for in, for inviting me. Um, it's it's a pleasure to give a talk at this seminar. Um, so uh, today, what I'm gonna talk about uh, is some recent work that we've done on data-driven learning of non-local models, and in particular, how to use these this models when optimized to, to bridge scales. Um, this, this research is supported by the LDRD program at Sandia and by FILMS, which is a DOE mimic project. All right, uh, this is an outline, a brief outline of my talk. I'm going to start from challenges in homogenization uh, and propose a non-local strategy. Uh, and then I will talk about uh, different operator learning approaches. And in particular, I'm going to apply this operator learning to, uh, to build non-local circuits for subsurface, for anomalous subsurface transport. Um, and then uh, I'm going to use operator learning to build to build optimal architectures, neural network architectures that can learn governing equations. Um, if time allows, um, I'm going to talk about some recent work. Um, and please keep track of time. <laughs> Let me know where I am, and uh, I'll, I'll actually check on the time after I'm done with the first part of the talk. Uh, these are the people that contributed to this, to this presentation. Christian Glusa at Sandia Labs, New Mexico. John Foster at UT Austin. Stuart Sealing at Sandia Labs, uh, Hui Chen Yu and UAU at Lehigh, and Xiao Chu um, at UT Austin. All right, so uh, the systems that I'm gonna look at are complex systems where the small scale dynamics affects the global behavior of the solutions. And in particular, I'm gonna look at systems where the effects of heterogeneity at small scales need to be captured to guarantee reliable predictions. In these situations, uh, if we have a PDE that describes the model uh, at, the, at the very small scales, we can use this PDE and get accurate predictions. However, uh, when we have heterogeneities at the small scales, these have to be captured one by one. Uh, and so this makes PDE simulations very, very expensive. 
So there is the need for new upscaled models, so models that act at larger scales, um, that still capture the effects of, of these heterogeneities at the small scales, but they are, that are faster and, afford, and affordable. However, the process of upscaling hides pitfalls that can compromise the reliability of the models. And in particular, um, when we have heterogeneities, an homogenized model um, ends up following a different governing law and has different constitutive properties. Uh, and so I would say that this is the biggest challenge here. Um, the picture that I'm reported is uh, that I'm reporting is it's sent basically, and it's a very clear example of how these situations happen. Uh, there are a lot of heterogeneities at the small scale, um, and at the small scale, we can simply use an advection diffusion equation to capture, for example, the evolution of a pollutant in the subsurface. But as soon as we look at things at larger scales. A diffusion advection, advection equation is not going to capture, capture the behavior of the upscaled concentration. So we, we can say that classical homogenized models are in general not sufficient to, to fully reproduce accurately coarse grain behavior. Um, and so what we propose, what we claim is that integral operators can provide better descriptions than standard partial differential equations because they embed all time and land scales in their definition. And what I have here is a very, very simple example of an all-local operator, of an integral operator. And the time, the uh, land scale is embedded in the domain of integration. So it's this ball of radius delta centered at a point. Um, in this case, it's a, Euc a Euclidean ball. It doesn't have to be. But the point is that every point in the domain interacts with a neighborhood of points and the neighborhood has size delta. Delta is also called the horizon. Of course, um, there is another capability gap that comes with no local models. And is the fact that also integral operators as any other mathematical model depend on parameters that are in general not known. And the constitutive laws take the form of kernels or integrand functions. And it's really hard to establish them a priori. And it's also hard to give them a physical interpretation. So this being said, uh, no local models have been used successfully in the past. There are several examples of successful use of integral operators. And um, maybe the, the most popular is this paradynamics, which is an no local formulation of continuum mechanics. Um, in, in the context of homogenization, and in particular in the context of subsurface, there are, example, there are examples of uh, no local models that have been used successfully and that can reproduce this anomalous behavior that cannot be captured by a simple PDE. So in this specific case, um, here we have a, an advection diffusion equation where the diffusion is, is fractional, is no local. And this is the most, uh, probably popular example of a fractional operator in its integral form. It's the integral fractional Laplacian, where the kernel is this function here. It's, um, it's a singular, uh, strongly singular function. And these operators uh, prove to be very accurate to describe um, the, the transport of solutes in, in the subsurface. And here I'm reporting a very clear example, which of course was handpicked. It's a pretty striking example. This goes back to 2000 in a paper by Daniel Benson, uh, where on the main data set, it's, this is also um, a popular data set to, um, to test um, subsurface models uh, because of its heterogeneities. So here we have a comparison between the data, um, an alpha stable model. Uh, alpha stable um, distributions are the distributions which are solutions of fractional equations and a Gaussian model, which is the solution of the heat equation, basically, with an attraction term. So uh, this, is the, this is the PDE solution, and this is the fractional solution, which is clearly on top of the, on top of the data, while the Gaussian distribution completely misses um, the, um, the behavior of the concentration. So we do have examples of success stories uh, in the use of integral operators. And what's nice in this case, for example, about fractional operators is that we have a form of kernel that we know can reproduce specific physical properties. For example, with fractional, when we use fractional operators, we know what's the mean square displacement that our equation is gonna, is gonna capture. And that's why we can capture anomalous diffusion. But 
Our goal here is not only to find, for example, the best parameters of a fractional operator or of another non-local operator, but it's also to capture the, the whole, to learn the whole functional form of the kernel. So we're not gonna assume that we know the kernel and, and we're gonna learn the best functional form of the kernel. So the recipe that we use um, is a combination of machine learning algorithms or optimization, physics, uh, surrogates. Surrogates can be polynomial expansions, neural networks, um, different, different things. Um, and here I wrote functional analysis in, in this specific context, what we're really gonna use is the local vector calculus or the fractional calculus, which is um, the local vector calculus was introduced more or less 10 years ago. And it's a local counterpart of, um, of the classical calculus for no local operators. And basically allows us to recast a no local problem into a variational form and to analyze it in the same way as we analyze PDEs. Because once we, we get to the, to the variational form, you can forget about no locality and we can just deal with standard arguments of, of variational theory. So, uh, by using this combination, what we want to obtain um, is uh, an unlocal surrogate that is mathematically rigorous. And by this, we simply mean uh, well posed and, and stable, uh, physically consistent, so consistent with, with the physics. Generalizable means that the model that we come up with is going to be equally accurate in situations, in contexts that are much different from the ones that we used when we train the model. Uh, so the context that we used when we optimized, when we did optimization and machine learning. So um, that's the concept of generalizability. Uh, resolution independent means that we want the optimal model. For example, let's say we find a kernel. We want this kernel to work with any discretization, uh, any discretization size, well, and possibly any discretization. And we also want it to be uncertainly endowed, which means that we want to embed uncertainty so that we are able to say, this is the model that we propose, and this is how accurate it can be and how far it can be from the ground truth. So today I'm not gonna talk about this very last point. Um, uh, and if I have time, I'm gonna get to be in resolution independent. So the underlying assumption is that we can collect some data um, high fidelity data. This can come from measurements, from high fidelity simulations. Um, in, this, in, in my talk today, what we're going to use are high fidelity simulations on very fine grids, uh, in particular uh, finite elements or finite differences. Um, in some other works, we use as measurements um, simulations coming from molecular dynamics. So it really depends on the problem and it depends on, on what is available. The ultimate goal, as I said, is to find a non-local model, so an, actually a non-local operator or a non-local kernel that acts at coarser scales and still captures the effects of the small scale behavior. Um, here is uh, LK can be one of the operator, uh, I mean, the, the integral operator that I introduced earlier. K is going to be the kernel function. And this is in the context of, for example, a wave equation, but it doesn't have to be. The real goal is to identify the, the integral kernel. So I, um, I decided to give an overview since in my previous slide, I had this mix of um, machine learning and, and physics. I decided to give an overview of how physics can be embedded into uh, optimization algorithms or machine learning algorithms. And I um, and this is a figure that we put together in this, in this recent report that, uh, that was submitted to the National Academies. Um, so the way we combine uh, physics and, and machine learning uh, depends on the amount of knowledge that we have on the physics and how much we trust this, this knowledge. Uh, and, and so here we go from good, good physics knowledge, so we're confident, and uh, on the opposite side of the spectrum, we have poor physics knowledge. So when, when we trust the physics, we may impose the physics as an equality constraint in our optimization, so we prescribe it strongly. Uh, in between, we have weak physics constraints where, let's say, we have an optimization problem and we penalize the physics. We don't impose it exactly, but we penalize it. And I'm, I'm going to have examples of it. 
And here we don't impose if, if our knowledge is poor, for example, we don't we don't have a governing equation, we don't impose it, <laughs> nor strongly, um, not strongly nor weakly. But we may impose other, other things that we know about the problem. For example, we may know that our solution has to be between some bounds or our solution has to be positive or the mass has to be preserved. So we can still add physical content in, in different ways. So when we do have an equation, and let's say this is, this is the equation that we have, um, some nomenclature. So S is going to be a surrogate for a quantity of interest P. PIs are the data is the data set that we have. And this is the equation that we trust. And that's why we prescribe it strongly as, a, as an equality constraint in our minimization problem, where we want to find a surrogate that is as close as possible to the data. In the weak case, um, basically, we still minimize the difference between the proposed surrogate and the data. But instead of prescribing the constraint in a strong way, we prescribe it weakly through penalization. And so. We, we also minimize the residual of the equation. As I said, these equalities don't necessarily have to be equations, do, do, do not have to be PDEs or, or no local equations. They can be other things, as I said, mass conservation or bounds on, on quantities. So the, the reason why here I write partial discovery is because it, here we are not, we're not really discovering new physics. We are making a guess on, on a model that, that we think is, is the good one. And we're learning its parameters or part of the model, for example, the constitutive law. In, in, the, other, in the opposite part of the spectrum, uh, instead, we don't have equations. And we have two ways to proceed. We can do simple data regression. So uh, we, we can just, S can be, for example, a neural network. And we just want to find the neural network that is as close as possible to the data. And we're just going to end up with basically an interpolator in some sense. And, and we're not discovering any, any new physics. We just have something that interpolates our data. But if instead of having just the data, we have uh, some pairs, uh, input to output pairs. So the, our system has an input. And for every input, we can collect an output. Then instead of learning just a surrogate that interpolates data, we can learn a surrogate for the map from the input to output map. Um, and this, um, of course, we're not gonna, it's gonna be hard to end up with an actual e governing equation, but we're gonna end up with a map that given a new input is gonna give us a new output. And so, and, and this is why here I write um, discovery. So today I'm gonna focus on, on, on these two. Uh, we're gonna prescribe uh, constraints strongly, or we're gonna learn the whole, um, uh, the whole input to output map. Um, by the way, a, a classical example of this, we, we, done it, we have to go back uh, in uh, a lot of years, is PDE constrained optimization. PDE constrained optimization is a classic example of this, of this approach here. All right, so um, I'm gonna now introduce our non-local operator learning technique, and I will start from our very first formulation and then say something about how we adapted it to different, uh, different problems that we considered. Uh, so here, uh, the, we are in our first work, we looked at a very, very simple equation. So a non-local Poisson equation. L is a non-local Laplacian. This is the form of the non-local Laplacian. Uh, K is the kernel, and it's clearly um, applic application dependent and determines the regularity properties of the solution. So this is, this is what we want to find. We have three steps. Uh, we assume, as I said, to have high fidelity, high fidelity data. We have pairs of F and U, so a forcing term and solution. And uh, we start by finding a surrogate for the kernel. So in this case, in our first work, what we decided to use is a combination of Bernstein polynomials. So it's a linear combination. So the unknowns, the phi i's, the psi, i, the psi m, are gonna be the Bernstein polynomials of degree m. And uh, the only unknowns that uniquely determine the kernel are the cm's. We minimize the residual of the equation in L2 norm over the whole 
data set and we prescribe solvability constraints. So we, we, um, we make sure that by construction, the optimal model that we find uh, is gonna be well posed. Um, the, the interesting part here is that it's really easy to have a well posed problem uh, for this type of, of operator when the kernel is positive. But the problem is that positive kernels do not fully describe um, some, some system behavior. For example, if we're looking at material response, uh, so if we want to use these operators in the context of mechanics, um, we know that there's evidence that positive kernels do not tell the whole story, but we need sign changing kernels, so kernels that, that, can, that can take on negative values um, to fully describe the, the, the material response. And so that's why we wanted to find well closeness constraints that can guarantee that the model is still well posed, even when the kernel uh, is not necessarily positive. And by the way, uh, this type of minimization is a weak uh, way of prescribing the physics because here we're minimizing the residual. Uh, we, just as a note, we used this technique uh, in a more complex form, so for a more complex non-local operator, to come up with surrogates for molecular dynamics displacement. So just briefly, starting from, and this is uh, the material that we picked is graphene, uh, starting from some training uh, samples of single layer graphene, this is uh, the samples that we used uh, in, our, in our optimization, the goal was to find uh, an optimal non-local model that instead of acting at the molecular scale could act at much larger scales and reproduce the coarse-grained molecular dynamic displacement. Um, and what we did after finding the optimal kernel function was to test the optimal kernel functions in situations that were completely different from the ones that we used during training. And, um, and in particular, uh, we changed the domain and we changed the loadings. Uh, as you can see, the behavior here is, is, is completely different. Um, and this is a this and so this is the sample from molecular dynamic simulation, and this is the and this is our prediction uh, using instead uh, the non-local model. Um, and and here is here is the reference in case you know you you would like to hear more about this problem. Now um. I'm gonna switch to a different formulation where instead we don't minimize the residual. Uh, and in fact, in, in some applications, we found out that minimizing the residual was not good enough. Minimizing the residual was not giving the, the desired accuracy, for example. And I'll, I'll show you in which, in which case we have to switch to this formulation. So the, the, the problem is, is the same. Um, we want to learn the same quantity uh, but we're going to formulate the problem in a slightly different manner. Uh, we still collect data. In this case, we collect the quantity of interest and not necessarily the solution. And we have pairs of input and quantity of interest. Um, here we have a more, in some sense, a more complex kernel because now the kernel is also a function of time. Um, but we learn it pointwise. So I'm, I'm providing a whole set of the of the things that that we tried. Um, I'm going to say more about the choice of, of these functions. So here, we don't minimize the residual, but we minimize a function of, of interest. And in particular, uh, we're going to use the quantities of interest that we can measure. So we're going to minimize the prediction of the quantity, the difference between the prediction of the quantity of interest and the ones that we observed. And by the way, an example can be the evaluation of the solution at some surface, at some control plane in, in the application that I'm going to talk about today. And the constraints instead, in this case, are the actual equation. Now, here I'm using, except, I'm using the, a parabolic non-local equation. So we have the partial time derivative, non-local Laplacian, and the forcing term. And also in this case, we're adding solvability constraints, which in the presence of time, they're, they're much easier than in the previous example. So we used this technique for wave propagation through heterogeneous materials. And, and again, the objective is exactly the same. Um, we want to reproduce the propagation of a wave through 
um, a bar in this case that has an heterogeneous uh, micro scale uh, at the core scale. Uh, and, and the reason why no local model can achieve this is because it is because of its integral form uh, where every point interacts with the neighborhood and can capture, and, and this model can capture the effects of heterogeneities at smaller scales. I didn't put the reference, but if you're interested, I'm, I'm happy to share this work. Now, let's get to the application that I would like to talk about today, which is learning kernels, time-dependent kernels, um, for non-local models that describe at the core scale anomalous transport in heterogeneous media. So the situation that we have here is, uh, this is uh, some medium, uh, a portion uh, in the subsurface, and uh, we have a matrix and some inclusions. These are the inclusions. And what characterizes them is a big difference of uh, permeability or conductivity. So there are jumps here in, in the media, in the medium properties. So the problem that we're interested in is we're dropping some particles, some uh, pollutant, let's say, or solute uh, in, um, in this field that has advection. So uh, there is an advective field, and the particles that are dropped here are transported uh, in the subsurface. Now, we want to find uh, an optimal model that describes at the coarse scale um, the concentration of the evolution of the concentration of the particles. And we want to do this only on the basis of some measurements. So we don't assume to know, and, and this is because this is what's actually done in practice. We, we only people that work in the fields only collect um, measurements uh, at some specific location. So these are called control planes. And so we are gonna place some control planes in some parts of, of this channel. And we're only gonna measure the evolution in time of the concentration at that specific location. So these curves are called breakthrough curves. So this is the non-local model that we have in mind, is the one that I had in my previous slide. Uh, it's a parabolic non-local equation with that faction. And this is the non-local operator that I introduced earlier. Now, what are the high fidelity simulations that, that we consider here? First of all, uh, we, we consider, and, and this is, of course, this is only a small part of, of our domain. So there are several other uh, periodic cells here. Um, we're gonna compute the, the flow field. Uh, and to do this, we're gonna solve Darcy's equation uh, with, with the finite element map. Um, this is a, let's say an offline step. We need the advection field. We need a manufactured advection field to perform our, our high fidelity simulation since we don't have real data. So once we, we do this simulation, we have a flow field. And then uh, here's where we, when we inject particles, uh, at some point in this channel, and we follow the movement of the particles um, throughout the flow. Uh, this can be done either with a, a parabolic equation, uh, a transport equation that um, describes the evolution of the concentration or in a Lagrangian form uh, with, the, with this equation. We decided to go with this. This is what's uh, this is very standard in, in subsurface applications, um, and this is what physicists do. So we dropped one uh, 10 to the fifth particles, and we solve this equation with the finite, on a finite difference grid. Um, once we once we solve for these 10 to the fifth particles, we can we have a high fidelity concentration field, and we use this high fidelity concentration field to measure the evolution in time of the concentration at some specific locations. And that's the only data, that's the only data set that we're gonna use. Now, um, as I said, we want to course, we want to find a model that acts at coarser scales. So we are gonna move our upscaling here goes from 2D to 1D. So we are gonna go in the flow direction. We're gonna pick a preferential direction, which is the one that goes with the flow. Um, and we're going to put one coarse grain degree of freedom per cell. So there is a huge reduction in, in cost, as, as you may imagine, since we go from 2D to 1D and the grid is much, much coarser. So what we're going to do is to compare uh, different models. 
uh, a local model, and by local I mean a simple diffusion advection equation, a local fractal model, and by fractal I mean that instead of having uh, a diffusivity in the local model, we have a diffusivity scaled by the time, and I'm going to explain why uh, we made this choice, which is also in the literature. And uh, the non-local diffusion advection equation that I proposed earlier, where the kernel depends on the time. Now, the reason why we pick this, uh, this scaling is because um, we know that the mean square displacement of the particles is not a linear function of the time. So the mean square displacement, which is this quantity, tells us how points in time deviate from a reference location. So, it's well known that in the, in the subsurface, as soon as we upscale, the mean square displacement is not linear, but is, is a power law. Now, what's, what's for sure is that this equation, uh, the classical PDE, cannot recover a non-linear mean square displacement. But um, in, this, in this setting, the mean square displacement is a function of t. It's linear in time. Um, now, for fractional models, which are the ones that I introduced at the very beginning uh, for subsurface application, um, we can recover uh, nonlinear mean square displacements. However, no, fractional models come with a lot of challenges, including the fact that delta, the interaction radius or the support of the integration is infinite. And computationally, that's a big um, bottleneck. Um, and also, uh, they have a very strong singularity in their kernel. And this makes um, the, the computations really costly uh, and the implementation not, not trivial because we need sophisticated or even adaptive, sometimes quadrature rules to solve those, um, those integrals. So we want to go with non-local operators that have a bounded support. So we want delta to be finite and to be small for computational reasons. Um, and, and we don't want singularity. So we want simple, no local operators. Um, however, as soon as you, even if you have a fractional model and you truncate it, so if you, if you force the support to be finite, as soon as you truncate, your operator uh, is such that the mean square displacement is linear. So by truncating the operator, we basically kill the possibility of having um, a, a nonlinear mean square displacement in time. And that's why, we make our kernel time dependent and we scale it by a power of the time. And our goal it will be not only to find the KIJs, so the spatial components of the kernel, but also to estimate the, let me call it fractional power of the kernel, which basically uh, quantifies the intensity of the decay and guarantees that the mean square displacement is a power law. All right. Now, how do we find the optimal kernel? We apply the three-step procedure that I introduced earlier, and I'm going to translate it for this specific problem. And I'm going to describe it for model three, which is the one that we're interested in, but exactly the same procedure can be applied to these, where the unknowns are either this quantity or this quantity and the fractional power. All right, so we collect high fidelity breakthrough curves. So as I said, we simulate the flow, we simulate the particles, and then we look at the evolution of the particle concentration only at specific locations. So these are gonna be our high fidelity data. Um, we approximate the kernel, as I explained before, and then we minimize uh, a function of interest, which is the difference between the predicted breakthrough curves through you know, the, the ones predicted by one of the three models, the measured breakthrough curves, and some additional constraints. Uh, the, sub, the, the constraints are uh, the fact that the concentration satisfy the, the governing law, uh, one of the three. Uh, and for the non-local case, uh, we're gonna ask the kernel to be positive. So this is not really for well-posedness reasons because as, well, there's a lot to say, but we want the kernel to be positive because uh, these, these equations have a nice parallel with um, probability distributions. And uh, these equations can be seen as the master equation 
uh, of a stochastic process and the kernel represents the jump rate and you don't want a jump rate to be to be sign changing so just a few notes on the terms this is the breakthrough curve mismatch and these are some physics constraints on the kernel these get a little technical i'm happy to describe them if if you're interested but i'd, I'd like to skip them for now okay so let's look at some results um, what we have here uh, are the breakthrough curves at a specific location. And this location was part of the training set. So it's a location that we used for training. And we're going to compare the three models that we proposed. Now, something important is that this green line uh, is at a specific time instant. And this is the last time in instant that we used for training. So after this time, it's all prediction. So it's not. Um, it's not part of the training set anymore. So what, what we have here is uh, the particle tracking. So the high fidelity is the orange line and the blue line is the proposed model. This is the pure local model. And we can see that the pure local model fails in particular after the training time. The fractal model does definitely a much better job. And this is due, literally due to the scaling. But the local model is the one that performs best, and that in particular is on top of the high fidelity model when we pass the training time. On the bottom, we have a different type of analysis in some sense. Um, we are going to look at, break, at the error of the breakthrough curves. So it's the first part of our loss functional. So it's the difference, the error of, of the breakthrough curve at locations that are not contained in the training set. So uh, past 40 we have that these locations are not part of the training set. And so this tells us how good the model is in circumstances that are different from the ones that we use to do the optimization. So the green line is the error of the local model, the orange of the fractal, and the blue of the non-local. And we can see that the non-local model is always more accurate than, than the other two PDs. So now, since everybody's using neural networks, we did something really not, well, not sophisticated. So, but we just wanted to take a black box neural network, feed forward neural network, and use it to fit the breakthrough curves, just blindly to see whether neural networks could do a better job than, than our model. So uh, the answer is that, and, and this is known, that neural network networks are really good at interpolation. And in fact, uh, within uh, the training range, the neural network does a very good job. But as soon as we leave the training time, uh, the neural network fails to, to be predictive. And, and again, this is, this is expected, but this is certainly a confirmation. Uh, here we have instead the different perspective. Instead of looking at the time, we look at different locations for the breakthrough curves. And we compare our non-local model, which is the one at the bottom, with the neural network. And we see that the non-local model, model is more accurate when it comes to points that are beyond the training set. And this is another example where instead of using three, we, we are basically checking how sensitive our method is to the number of breakthrough curves that we use. So as expected, the more breakthrough curves we use, the more accurate is our model. And in fact, the, this is represented by the orange line, which is more accurate uh, than the blue line. But the difference is, is not substantial. But we see how the accuracy of a neural network deteriorates as soon as we decrease the number of data that, that we use. So. The takeaway message here, and, and this is not just for the breakthrough curve example, but it's really for the whole um, homogenization using the local models. Um, so the takeaway message is that the optimal, the optimal model really embeds the material properties. So it, it, it's really catching the constitutive behavior of the material, material or the media under consideration. Um, of course, uh, if we change the media, if we change um, the material, like in the molecular dynamics example, if we switch from graphene to steel or, or whatever, um, it, it's not 
it's not gonna, it, it's, that's a way more challenging problem that we haven't tackled yet, uh, but it, it's not gonna work for a different material. Um, as it's true for other PDE models, clearly. Um, but another uh, important point uh, are the generalization properties. So the, the model generalizes well to uh, settings that are different from training, and these settings include uh, different domain configurations and different loading scenarios. Uh, and this is a, this simply means that the model is not sensitive to the boundary conditions, to the loadings that were used during training. Uh, it also generalizes to different grid resolutions. I haven't presented this um, in, in, in what I just uh, presented here in the slides, but in the papers we have tests where we test the optimal model on, on different resolutions. So, so Marta, I have a question, if I may jump in at this point. Please. So uh, if, if I understand uh, th this work up to here, you're for the for the kernel, you're, you are using this, the Bernstein polynomials or what is the expansion for the Yes, kernel? so the for the molecular dynamics, let me go back and I'll tell you. Here, yes, Bernstein polynomials, also in wave propagation, mm -hmm. But uh, in this work, it's a pointwise estimate of the kernel. And also in a previous work on bound-based paradynamics, we did a pointwise estimate of the kernel. Okay. So we used, we used both. The nice thing of using Bernstein polynomials uh, is that, or using polynomials, is, is that you end up with the with a function, right? And you can, so I, I this is the, the approach that I would recommend I um, because you end up with a function that can be evaluated everywhere. In the subsurface, we, we went pointwise because we were not planning to use, uh, we were not planning to test, for example, uh, resolution independence. And, and that's where having a function is key because you can evaluate it wherever you want. You have a constitutive law and you use it. Uh, in the other case, you have a discrete constitutive law. And so it's really uh, tied to the type of discretization that you used during training. It was not the focus of that work. And so we went just with pointwise estimates. But if there is interest in having um, a function that one can evaluate anywhere, which is really my suggestion in case of no local, because you have to perform quadrature and you want to be free to use the quadrature, any quadrature rule. So you want to be free to evaluate your kernel at any point in your support. So I, I, I think this is yeah. um, maybe a better choice. So and, and, and for the subsurface model, you reduce it to 1D, but so I, I, and so and so those were the, the results you were showing most most just now were the were for the subsurface. So so that's 1D, but what about the what happens? Uh, do they does it work equally well in in when you go to multiple dimensions? Uh, Actually, yeah. What the current, doing, you know. Yeah, what we're doing now uh, is to go from three D but still to one D. Um, the point is really if there is a preferential direction of sure. um, of flow, uh, then we pick that direction, and that's the one. Uh, that we use for our upscale model. Okay. Um, I believe, um, so for the bond-based paradynamics, so for no-local continuum mechanics, we did a 2D to 2D um, upscaling. And we basically went from a 2D very fine grid to a 2D coarse grid. Um, and, and that works too. I think it really depends on the problem. Like in, in mechanics, we had uh, a plate, an heterogeneous plate, but there was no preferential behavior, right? It's not that there is a direction that is more interesting for any reason. And so in that case, we did a 2D upscaling, which simply meant taking from a fine grid, a coarser grid in the same dimension. Here, the, the, the purpose, the idea is simply that there is a preferential direction. And so why, why not use it? So, so there's actually a related question in the chat. Uh, maybe I can sure. ask it right now. Please. So, it's from, so it's from Liang Wang. Says uh, impressive work. Thank you. And then says, uh, is it necessary to <clears throat> to rewrite the non-local operator in an, in for instance by convolution with a with an unspecified kernel, and then learn the kernel? 
that is, do you do you need to first rewrite the non-local operator? Oh, uh, you mean compared to the very first? I mean, let's see if I'm understanding the question. Like to write it as u of x minus u of y times a kernel rather than going with this very general form. Yeah, maybe, maybe I think so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Yes. Um, yes, and no. Right. It really depends. So, and there's so much to say about it. So, if you go with this form, it's even more complicated to add physics constraints because there's, I mean, you're learning everything basically, right? And to make sure that, for example, so something that you always want to do in a local is to make sure that when the ball shrinks, so when the no locality disappears, you recover the, the PDE, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you go with, the, with the, an equation like, with a form like this, that's really hard. Instead, if you put some structure in it, so for example, if you start writing this as, for example, f of x, y, u minus f of x of y, x, u. So if you give it some, for example, anti-symmetry structure, which is what you want to do in mechanics, uh, then it becomes much easier to prescribe physics constraints. So, I mean, it, it's true that the more general, the better, but at the same time, whatever you know about your problem, you better add it to it because otherwise you're really looking for, you know, nothing like it's, it's too, it's just too general. So this form instead, when we use this form, when this kernel is properly scaled, um, for example, if in, you're in 1D and this kernel is a constant divided by the cube of the radius, one over delta cubed, you're 100% guaranteed that at the limit for delta going to zero, this thing becomes a Laplacian. So, and you want this consistency behavior. So, and, and, and this is a test that we do all the time. You let delta go to zero and you make sure that your operator converges to the Laplacian. Now, we prescribe it by construction so that the no local model that we learn is 100% guaranteed to converge to the Laplacian as delta goes to zero. So this is why, and, and this is, I think, the most popular no local operator because it does converge to the no local Laplacian. And, and you can write it as a composition of no local divergence and no local gradient through the no local calculus. And that what, that's what allows you to then do variational theory because this object is a composition of a non-local divergence and a non-local gradient. Um, I don't know if this answered the question, but it a specific form allows you to use a lot of tools, basically. Yeah, no, that, that's great. I, I think it generally it definitely speaks to the to the broad to, to the theme of the question. So, so yeah, okay. please go ahead. Yeah. Um, how much time do I have? So we are at, uh, let me see, 47, so about 10. I, can wrap up. I don't mind wrapping it up. Uh, um, yeah, I what? think we have about 10, ten uh, okay, oh, we want to allow some more questions. So maybe five, seven minutes or so, and we can allow a couple yeah, of questions. I'll, That's yeah, right. I'll try with five minutes. I'll just give an idea of what we're mm -hmm. doing here, um, and then right. we can just jump to the questions. Let me see the time, I'll keep track of the five minutes. So here, the question, the question is, um, whether we could use uh, the non-local operator learning technique um, to basically come up with a map that maps input to output. Um, I'm gonna make the question more precise. So we're looking for an operator and, uh, and I'll talk about the surrogate specifically, uh, that given an input can come up with an output without specifying uh, the, the map itself, but just providing a survey. So in, in this specific work, we wanted a map that could act as both an image classifier. So given an image, we can predict the class and, and what's called neural operator, which is one of the blocks that I explained before. So an input to output map for a physical system. Going back to the subsurface example, given a permeability, I want a map that can tell me what's the pressure field, for example, in the Darcy's equation. So we, we choose this map to be a neural network. And so the whole goal is to come up with the best neural network that can do this. So as I, as I just said, we want to give some structure to this neural network. And the structure 
depends on some properties that we want the neural network to have. We want the network to have uh, interactions in the feature space, which is in the set of nodes. We want nodes to interact with each other. We want the architecture to be able to be deep, and, and this is because it gives improved accuracy. But when you have a deep architecture, you have to make sure that it's stable. So as you increase the number of layers of your network, your network doesn't become unstable. We want the network to be resolution independent, meaning that uh, it shouldn't depend on the resolution of the input. So if you give a permeability collected on a coarse grid, that, that map should perform uh, equally accurately um, when used uh, on a permeability on a uh, computed on a very fine grid. And we want it to be interpretable, which is a very loaded concept in machine learning. But what we mean by interpretable, interpretable is that we, by looking at the architecture, we can recognize something that we can analyze, basically. In particular, this is a classical, the classical example is neural ODEs, which are neural networks that are formulated as an ODE. And so you can use the ODE theory to analyze the neural network um, properties. I'm going to jump to the neural network that we're using just to give you an idea of what we're doing. We're going to use the architecture of a ResNet, but what we're going to prescribe is that all the nodes interact and that uh, the nodes are seen as a continuum. So they're not discrete nodes, but they're like the real line. And we're going to do this by using for our network update, not the standard uh, activation function applied to an affine transformation, but we're going to use integral operators. So basically the network update is going to become an integral operator. Long story short, the way we formulate our network, this is the network update. This basically tells us the definition of a new layer in the network, and you can see the time as the layer, as a function of the previous layers. Uh, and this is the structure of a ResNet. And this neural network update is defined by the previous layer plus an integral operator. So the whole key here is that when, when we look at this network update and we divide by delta t, we can recognize a first time derivative here, and we can reinterpret the integral update as a local Laplacian. And then, well, we added for stability an extra term. And in the context of PDEs, this can be seen as a reaction term. And, and then we can reinterpret the whole network architecture as a parabolic non-local equation with a reaction term. And then we can use the non-local vector calculus to analyze it. So the key here was that by using the non-local calculus, we could provide anal an analysis for our neural network architecture and guarantee that not only this is well posed, but it's stable so that we can take the limit of infinite layers. Clearly, we don't take infinite layers, but we can take very deep networks and the network is going to be accurate. I, I'm going to stop here. Uh, we applied this network. Uh, one example is the Darcy's equation. I'm just going to stop here. For different permeabilities, um, the network gives you the corresponding pressure field. And we compared it with some uh, uh, neural operators that can be found in the literature. And the network, our network show, showed to be more accurate and more stable. So this really gives you just a, a very general idea of, of this work. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to provide uh, you know, the paper if any of you is interested. And I'm gonna. I'm just gonna stop here, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Marta. Uh, really, very nice. Uh, as you as you uh, showed clearly, this is uh, barely touching the surface of what of some of the stuff that's possible, and it's probably been done as well. Uh, just following up on the questions, there is. Uh, oh, but by the way, to the audience, we have about seven minutes, uh, six to seven minutes. So please go ahead and either unmute and ask yourself questions. There is one question in the chat. I'll, 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 I'll provide that to Marta, but meanwhile, just provide more questions in the chat or ask directly. So, so this question is from, is from Sid Srivastava asking, uh, what are the difficulties involved in formulating a non-local infection term? So, so we've been looking at, you've been looking at differential, a sort of a fractional calculus, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so the, the, the question is about having a no local advection term, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, very good question. Um, so it depends on what we really mean by this, because um, any uh, non-symmetric kernel used in a, in a non-local Laplacian induces advection. So, uh, but that's no local advection, which must be interpreted as a preferential direction of diffusion. So uh, if we want to prescribe a preferential direction for diffusion, we simply use a no local uh, non-symmetric kernel, and we're gonna achieve that goal. If instead, what we want to achieve is drift, then, um, then a gradient will do the job, a classical gradient. Um, what's there? There's a, a deal. I mean, there, there's a, a concern though, which is we usually use no local models because of their uh, reduced regularity requirements. So when you use an integral operator, um, oftentimes your functions just have to be in L2, unless you use fractional kernels and then you go to HS. But um, a constant kernel, for example, or any integrable kernel, square integrable kernel, uh, defines a map from L2 to L2. And then all of a sudden you introduce a gradient and your function needs to have a gradient. So that, that becomes an issue. Um, so what one could do uh, if, if the desire is to keep low regularity on the functions is to use a non-local gradient. And um, the, the gradient associated with the Laplacian that we're using, sorry, this is a very, <laughs> I mean, it's a complicated answer to, to a, a simple question, but the local gradient associated with the Laplacian that I presented today is a two-point function. So it's a function of x and y, and we don't want that because our equation needs to be defined uniquely at one x. And so in this case, we could use is a weighted gradient that was introduced exactly for this reason. Uh, so to have a function defined at a functional that, that is evaluated just at x. And so weighted gradients are certainly an option uh, they've been used mostly in the fractional context. Um, and, uh, and basically, they allow you to keep the same regularity requirements on the solution. So if you want these continuities, you're, you, you can have these continuities, even if you have a gradient. Um, and these gradients in at the limit for delta going to zero, they converge to standard gradients, to classical gradients. So their action is indeed advection. So again, log answer for, for a simple question, but. So uh, Derek, thank, uh, thanks, Marta. There's one other question, and if we have time, I will follow up myself. But this is from Sheikha al Khadr asking, for highly oscillatory PDEs, what is a good setup of the neural network in terms of hyperparameters? Hmm. Well, I, I'm not sure the key is the network. Well, let me. Let me explain. So when you have a highly oscillatory behavior, I think a key uh, component is to have some representatives of this oscillatory behavior in your training set. That's really the most important thing. Because if your training set doesn't have uh, those components, that your map is going to miss them. And, and we saw this in the, it's not for the neural network, it, it's actually the same when you use Bernstein polynomials, for example. Um, if your surrogate is trained on data that do not exhibit that oscillatory behavior, then your, your surrogate is not gonna catch it. Um, if all the solutions act at the same frequency, then, then everything is fine. But especially in the cases in which the frequencies change, it's important to have the high frequencies in the training set. Now, when it comes to our operator, to our neural operator and to the number of, um, you know, of the network hyperparameters, um, well, more layers always bring higher accuracy. The number of nodes in our case didn't really seem to highly affect uh, the, the accuracy. Something that I didn't say is that in just because of time, uh, in the neural operator, the neural operator itself is a network and the kernel that we learn within the network is a shallow neural network itself. And that's usually three, 
it's shallow. So three layers and uh, the number of nodes is not super high. So there is a lot to tune. Um, there's a lot of tuning going on, but um, it's more the depth that makes the difference, I think. One last question from me, I'll take the prerogative, which is that uh, with certain non-local calculus models, and we played around with, we, we work with some of these uh, non-local calculus models coming from graphs. Um, from? Uh, graphs, you know, you can define a non-local calculus on a graph. So, so Oh, I'm, graphs, yes, yeah, yes, yes. Sure, but but then there the the, the t you you one has flexibility there even in terms of constructing the non-local calculus where you can pick weights which can have certain decay properties and, and that yeah. actually determines your non-local operator itself. Now yeah. now are are there are there uh, is there work that takes those kinds of ideas but also for higher higher order uh, non-local calculus right where one is going to higher order mm -hmm. uh, derivatives in uh, Oh, in that sense, yeah. um, I think uh, they just went up to the Hessian. That's it. Okay, uh, I the, see. As far as the Hessian. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so not okay. So not okay. Nothing yet approaching things like uh, like non-local biharmonic operators or, or or something. Okay. Okay. Great. Um. All right. Uh. That's that's uh. We're right about on time, and uh, thanks again, Marta, for a really uh, and uh, you know wide-ranging, deep talk uh, with generated interest. Uh, so thanks again. Thanks to everybody for thanks attending. For yep. All right. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marta. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.